Samuel chapter 17. Uh, It's a famous story, even if you're someone who has never ever attended church or a Sunday school class or even opened up or cracked open the Bible, uh, you've at least heard the names David and Goliath, and today that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 17, and right as we get to our portion of chapter 17, Goliath has pronounced himself to be this great champion for the Philistines. He has great confidence that he can defeat any Israelite, and he challenges them to send someone to fight with him. And they're all scared, except for this one shepherd boy named David. So we're actually going to pick up from verse 32 and read all the way to verse 49. This is the word of the Lord. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck it and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? that you come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. So when I think of David and Goliath and maybe a lot of memories or thoughts come into your mind, if you're an athlete, maybe there was that one moment you were a David an underdog as we also like to call it, and you entered into that competition. No one expected you to win. The odds were against you. There was no logical or rational reason why you should win or be given a chance to win, and you did. 
Or maybe you were on the other side and you were a Goliath and you went in and you were a bit cocky and confident and everyone thought you were going to win and even with just a few seconds left on the clock, down by more than anyone could surmount on a typical night, you just had this confidence knowing you were going to win and you didn't. Maybe those thoughts come to mind. Maybe it was a challenge of, I don't know, Everest proportions academically, professionally. Again, all the odds stacked against you. No expectations, even those whom you would have wanted to share encouraging yet deceitful words that you can do it. And then you conquered it, didn't you? And that was your David and Goliath moment. And God wants you to go away today being confident. And he uses the word, actually, and how appropriate, isn't it, that we have some youth in, well, I'm still youth, relatively speaking, but we have some youth in the room, and it says, don't let people look down on you for your youth. I mean, even the Apostle Paul used that word, didn't he? His advice to Timothy was, don't let people look down on you for your age. Yeah, I may be young, And I may have made more mistakes than anybody would want. And I'll probably still continue to do so. But gosh, I am a child of God. Whatever the case may be. And sadly, I think this is one story. I think the church so often, either from the pulpit side or the pew side, has gotten wrong. You see, if I stand here and I simply give you a message, whether you're young or old, if I just flip the tables, don't get so down on your age. It's just a number. Sure, retirement's right around the corner. Yeah, you wake up each day and your body creaks and groans and you moan and, and you just struggle to get out of bed. The pain just persists. And nobody wants to hang around an old person and you just fall asleep on the couch in the middle of the movie and everybody takes selfies with you while you look like a zombie. Yeah, it's okay, but you still have life. Rise up, you elderly. Rise up against the worldly words that tell you you can't do it because you're too old. You're done. Kaput. Be that David that rises above the occasion, the challenge. Well, honestly, that has nothing to do with God. I could pick any old person from the street, give them this passage, and they could even whisper to me, I'm not a Christian. It's okay. It's only David and Goliath. And they'll tell you that message. So there's certainly some worldly applications that we can take out of this, and I I can't devote the time into going over all the little details, but there are a lot of worldly pieces of advice like, yeah, you know, I would always tell my children, even without using the words Jesus or God, and say, you can do it. I don't know if you realize, I am the tallest male in my family. No one believes me. It's all a matter of perception. It's all perception. But my son, who was younger than me, he goes out there and he plays some basketball games over the weekend, and there were some tall guards that he went against, and I would always tell him, don't let height be your enemy. Use that to your advantage. Just like David. The Philistines, they look to javelins and spears and swords and height and armor. All you need is one stone. Sounds great, right? It's not a Christian message. And the Christian message has to. What distinguishes us from any ordinary message or people in the eyes of God, or even when we look, reflect upon who we are as individuals, it has to be different. And that difference comes from Jesus. So hopefully at the end, you you kind of get to the point where you see, ah, It's because I am in Christ, dot, dot, dot. I remember one particular David and Goliath moment. It was on April 1st, in the middle of the week, in 1985. And I'd love to tell you I felt like an academic David, and 
there is this exam looming over me and I was gonna rise to the occasion and fight through it all night. That wasn't the case. I was watching Villanova seated number eight defeat Georgetown seated number one in March Madness. I, don't, I guess I don't have any basketball fans in the room. But to me, that defines David and Goliath. They had played two other times that season, and this was the one game definitely they would lose. Didn't deserve to be on the same court with Patrick Ewing, and they won. I believe it was 66 to 64. They won. And every time you go to YouTube or you bring up that game, people say it was David versus Goliath, and David prevailed. I also think about Malcolm Gladwell, who is a New York Times bestselling author, who wrote a book called David and Goliath. And in one of his points, he says, well, you know, you shouldn't be so surprised that the Davids win in this world. They actually win more often than you realize. But there are reasons for that. Now, the problem with Malcolm Gladwell, I love the information he brings forth, talking about this condition called acromegaly, which inflicts people with extreme height. Andre the Giant, even the man's ta- or the tallest man in the, in the history of mankind. And Goliath would have had this, which was his weakness, which allowed David to slay him. It sounds great, and I don't even deny maybe the possibility or the truth of whatever he's arguing, but he's simply saying there's a reason why, and David's always have an opportunity to win, but that's not what this story is telling us. What I love about the stories of the Bible also is that whenever you go into a story, you naturally, it's instinctive, to gravitate towards a character maybe a couple of them, or you may not necessarily, maybe you scan it like you watch a movie and you see someone and you're like, oh, that's not me, but honey, that's you. Oh, that is so you, right, we'll do that. Always kind of get sucked into these characters. And I don't think God doesn't want us to do that in the narratives. Again, I think it's part of who we are when we hear another story, how am I similar, how am I not? And so we'll look at David and Goliath, and where are you? Where do you gravitate instantly? Is it David? I would actually encourage you not to go that direction. I would actually encourage you to go towards Saul or his brothers or the other nameless soldiers who had been standing there looking and saying, really? Why don't we just walk away with some dignity and say, this is a battle we can't win. Rather than send this little boy, who, okay, he can kill a few animals, send this little boy and really get embarrassed. Like, that is the best we can produce. That's the best soldier we can put forward. That's our solution to a Goliath. It's embarrassing. Where do you gravitate? Do you gravitate towards David and that the message primarily, and it certainly is one of them, but is it primarily you need to be faithful to God? And we do. I would never tell any believer to go into any situation, whether it's financial, academic, relational, psychological, emotional, whatever it may be, you must always go with faith in the Lord. Seize every opportunity. There is no gray area circumstance. Every situation in your life, whether you are just sitting on your couch by yourself, when you turn on that TV and what show you choose to watch, or when you are having dinner, and how you behave in front of your children, or to your wife or husband, or whether they're there and what you say, how you utter it, what is your consideration when you say those words, every situation must be seized for the Lord. And it must be filled with faith. So that is certainly a powerful message, but again, not the primary one I want to give you today. You see, in the backdrop of this narrative, the story is a greater story. And sometimes as individuals, and we're so narcissistic, even as Christians, we like to think everything's just about me. God, me. I need more money. I need this. I want this. I don't like this. I don't like where you're leading me. It's about me when we have no consideration, even for the people in your immediate circles, 
or even that there are actually people outside your house walls, or even beyond your country's borders. It doesn't matter. All that matters is God, me. That's all that matters. But there's this greater story, and it's not just beyond the borders of self, or family, or country, or earth. It goes beyond all those. It spans from the beginning of time to when Jesus returns, and it extends even beyond that. You see, when even Jesus returns, it's not going to say, let's forget about the past, let's never talk about it. Actually, we're going to celebrate it forever and ever and ever and ever, and I could just go on like that. And the backdrop is simply that God reigns, and there has risen this enemy that God is fighting And I would actually say God has defeated. Now that enemy even knows that it's been defeated, but it's continuing to fight. And why not? Honestly, I've been to my share as a coach, as a player, and as a spectator of seeing mercy rules applied in a sports contest. It's really tough. You know, like in baseball, if you get to the second inning in high school, I think if you're losing by like 10, I mean the second inning, and I've been there, they apply the mercy rule. In basketball, when you get to, let's say, I think if you're losing by 45 or something, then the clock just runs. And then everyone who doesn't know, they're asking, why is the clock not stopping? Because they're losing by 45. You just want to make the pain less. And Satan knows mercy rule has been applied, but he's going to keep fighting. He's going to still chuck up his threes. He's going to still go for his points. Try to draw fouls, still play the game out till it ends. He knows it. But the backdrop is simply that there is an enemy to God who is delusional enough, at least in the time of David, to think that that battle can be won, and God wants you to know that I already have this in the bag. And the enemy is represented by different figures and institutions. In fact, the great uh, thinker, theologian, Augustine, in his presentation, City of God, presents it in black and white, two sides. You are either with the Lord or you're not. Everything either stands with the Lord or they don't. Now, sure, there are things that I do and I say and I think and I feel that don't honor the Lord, but generally, as a child of God, I am on his side. And without Christ, I am on the other. So the backdrop is that, and in the book of Revelation, it talks about this oppositional figure as the Antichrist. And so many people have tried to identify who this person is. And I don't actually believe it's one person. Many have uh, speculated or argued that it was either the Roman emperor in the first century, Nero, who wanted to renovate certain parts of his palace in the city, Senate refused to give him funds, burns the city down intentionally, and he blames the Christians for it. Or just out of pleasure for a dining occasion, he would crucify Christians and burn them alive. It's got to be him, right? Or maybe Domitian, who was the one to follow, first century Roman emperor who persecuted Christians greatly. Maybe it's one of them. But to me, it doesn't really matter. There's so many different people and institutions that have risen throughout history that have stood up against God, the Lord. And Goliath is one of them. The Bible presents several of them. In the beginning, it was the serpent. And then we see it's Pharaoh. And then eventually, skipping a few, we see now it's Goliath. These people all represent, they're just different manifestations of the opposition against God. So against that backdrop, the story is not about, I'm going to stand up against Satan. Oh, no. I have no hope. Because even today, with Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, there are times where I still fail at Satan's temptations. Many times, more than I wish. Definitely more than I would want to confess or acknowledge to you. But it's not me, it's not you who's going to stand up against this Goliath, against Satan, against the dragon, against Pharaoh, against the serpent, against all these manifestations, these institutions, as stand up against the Lord, it is the one that God has anointed. It is Jesus. 
And so the primary, most pressing lesson is, whether it's new or a reminder, it is that Jesus earns that victory for us. It's funny, Saul was once said to be a head taller than everybody else. And here comes this other taller guy. Everyone should have pushed Saul like, King, you got to go. You're taller than everyone. Goliath's taller than everybody. I think it's got to be you. He doesn't go. Nobody goes. And then even as, as Rich prayed, there's the mention of all this armor. Now, those are, those are things that God gives. And I'm not saying um, if you ever go out to battle, go ill-equipped. I'm not saying that. But it's wanting to make this really profound contrast between those who depend upon the things that God has provided as opposed to trusting simply in the Lord. And for me, I usually trust in those things, even today. But I need to be reminded that because I'm unable to fully depend on the Lord, there must be that one who does, has, and always will, and he's the one that fights my battles. He's the one that even today on this side of history has already defeated Goliath. He has already defeated God. And I actually suggested on, on Easter that David, after killing Goliath, chops off his head, puts it in a bag, takes it back to Jerusalem, and then we never hear about it, but I think we do. And that's when Jesus dies on a place called the place of a skull. That the descendant of David would be victorious at the very place where the head of Goliath rests. Because Goliath is only a minion who represents the great prince of air, Satan. Greater than all of us, but not greater than the son of David. And the son of David, as we are to be reminded in the story, didn't go with the odds stacked with him, but against him. You see, every underdog story doesn't quite work out the way we would like it to. I would love to tell you that as a believer, if you always trust in the Lord, you're going to come out victorious. It's not true. Now, you may be like, well, then why bother? Well, I'll tell you why bother. Because if you always trust in the Lord, there will always be a benefit. There will always be encouragement. There will always be God with you, God encouraging you, standing up for you. But if I'm going to God and saying, God, I'm the underdog and I'm going to trust you that I'm going to gain this victory, then I'm not really asking God to decide what is best for me. I'm already telling him. And God, what I know is at this moment, irregardless of everything else in my life, anything else that's going on outside my life, it doesn't matter who else is suffering or what the negative consequences may be. God, I need this victory because I'm going to trust in you. That's not how God works. And I'm glad he doesn't. Because then that's allowing a foolish person to decide what's wisdom. But it's God's will, as Romans 12 12 tells us, it's God's will that's good, pleasing, and perfect. And you see, there's often those times when God may even allow me that victory and he intends it for it to be encouraging, strengthening. It propels me in my Christian walk. But what I do with it, I say, yeah, I got this. The next time I face something very similar, what do I do? I say, oh, well, God's on my side. I don't trust in him. I don't go to him in prayer. And then I lose. And then I lose, and what do I do? I'm going to blame God. I'm not going to blame myself. Like, God, I can't believe you you left me. What happened there? So God, this isn't a story about simply trusting and it's always going to work. Now, God does have a purpose. When it happens, how it happens, that's all according to his own will. But in this particular story, that David represents the almighty God in heaven. And the one in verse 45 and 46, I'll quickly read it for you, who says, David says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The one who defies God, God will defeat for us. He doesn't say, hey, you, go give it a try. You know, it's, there's, there are even lessons in defeat. No, he says, you can't, but I can, and his name is Jesus. 
This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, that the one true living God is the one that we worship. And that doesn't happen exclusively or monumentally through my little victories as a David. It happens because the son of David defeated sin, condemnation, and death on the cross. I may have my little victories today, but as the Bible says, the greatest victory, the final enemy that must be defeated is death. And that's something none of us can defeat. We don't stand a chance. And the only one that has, the only one that could, is Jesus. And the little lessons that you can take away apart from the reminder of being encouraged that Jesus is the one that has defeated the great enemy for you, on his terms, clearly demonstrating his power through the obnoxious imagery of a cross, through the injustice of crucifying God, that he would claim honor and glory and victory and give you life through his mercy and compassion. Only God could do these. You and I are to be reminded that our victories that disseminate his victory must be through humility, through mercy, through kindness, through sacrifice, to the glory of God, not for mine, not for my benefit, but for his. And praise God, you and I do get to enjoy the spoils of that victory, don't we? That he promises that great place, a time which will be unhindered, unaltered, in any way, forever and ever with him. Whether it's to the youth, to the old, look to the son of David who claims your victory for you. To parents, equip your children with the sword of the spirit, not the world's weapons. Youth, you've got a lot ahead of you. Sounds like commencement you know, speech. Got a lot ahead of you. Yeah, those things are needed. But your ultimate, your ultimate victory will be through Jesus. Because after those little ones, another one will come. But in the end, you'll reach that blockade. And you'll be reminded, and then you'll see with your very own eyes the truth that the final enemy is death. And the only one who has, for you, who has conquered it, is Jesus. But you look to him and trust in him. Amen. Let's pray.